there is no doubt that there is uh, a trend that some have discussed as the rise of nativism. Others have talked about it as a populist right. These are broader problems that are manifesting themselves in several Western European, but also Eastern European countries within democratic regimes is a very worrisome trend. A notable shift in many countries towards conservative political parties has been observed, with voters increasingly placing their trust in traditional ideas and practices. But what is driving this trend? Does it signify the decline of liberalism? Welcome to Reactive's Beyond the Byland podcast. I am Evi Kiori, and this week we will dive into the reasons behind the growing trust in conservative and right-wing parties by citizens across Europe and beyond. Populist parties, particularly those on the ideological conservative right, have been gaining larger shares of the vote in recent elections across Europe. Prime examples of this are various countries such as Greece, and looking back in the past, Italy and Sweden are there too. The electoral landscape is witnessing a surge in support for conservative and populist parties. Now, looking ahead, Spain is also in the spotlight as speculation suggests that the country may have again a conservative party governing the nation. But what is worrying for Spain is the fact that the populist party Vox, according to exit polls, is gaining significant ground. Between 2015 and 2019, the share of the vote going to populist parties in Spain doubled, with Vox experiencing substantial growth. So analysts are now waiting to see the results of the upcoming elections. And it doesn't stop here. The Netherlands witnessed right-wing leaning populist parties achieving their highest vote share in nearly a decade during the 2021 parliamentary elections. Hungary and Poland have also seen right-wing populist parties make significant gains over the past two decades. In Hungary, President Viktor Orbán's Fidesz party secured a supermajority in recent legislative elections. Poland's ruling Law and Justice Party saw its vote share quadrupled between 2001 and 2019. Now, the rise of conservative parties is not limited to these countries alone. Belgium and France have also experienced a significant increase in support for both conservative and populist parties. And this raises the question if this is becoming a general trend within the EU and beyond. We have uh, a lot of uh, indications that... um there are um, shifts uh, to the right. Haris Milonas is professor of political science at George Washington University. There is no doubt that there is uh, a trend, a general trend in the world that some have discussed as the rise of nativism. Others have talked about it as a populist right manifesting themselves in several Western European, but also Eastern European countries, but also in other parts of the world beyond Europe. And I think this trend within democratic uh, regimes is a very worrisome trend. The United States had uh, similar phenomena, India, Brazil, a lot of countries in the world have seen this type of a conservative turn or what I call, um, some, some have called the new nationalism. What they have in common, I think some of these movements from a nationalism perspective, they're trying to narrow the definition of nationhood. They're trying to narrow uh, the boundaries of belonging. And they actually in the process exclude a lot of people who previously were considered insiders from the group. I wouldn't say that it, it's a, a winning trend, meaning they don't necessarily form governments, but they often are important either coalition partners like we see in Spain, and now I'm coming closer to your point. Uh, Vox is a kind of party that in coalition with um, Partido Popular can deliver some victories in places where the socialists have been winning so far, right? And we saw that trend um, in the local elections. And now that we've established the existence of this trend, it's crucial to understand the underlying reasons behind it. So we asked Professor Milonas what factors are driving the rise of uh, conservative and right-wing parties. There is no doubt, I don't think anyone disagrees, that economic uh, and status dislocations are happening left and right as a result of what we've termed globalization, right? In other words, the, there are many losers from globalization, economic losers, but also status 
losers. Globalization has made a lot of people wealthier, but that number is really small relatively to the vast majority of people. The bottom is rising, meaning there are less poor people maybe over, over time, but the gap between what we would call the middle class or the former middle class and the really rich is growing tremendously. So there is a growing inequality between the top winners of the global, globalization and how economics is um, run right now, global economics, uh, global finance, and the general public, let's say, you know, the everyday person. It looks like the presence of inequality is responsible for generating insecurity, but it is not the sole factor driving voters towards adopting conservative solutions. The process of the industrialization also contributes to the sense of insecurity within the current economic environment. And within that, of course, we would put also the discussions about deindustrialization, right? Where a lot of uh, factories were moved to parts where cheap labor was available. And many people lost their jobs in, in the places that used to be the industrial heartlands, right? Globalization has taken everything to the next step. In the present age, characterized by substantial and rapid transformations in ideologies, cultures and morals, these very changes significantly influence the shaping of the current political landscape. All of these changes that are happening in morals, if you want, or identity-wise, are too fast-paced for some parts of the population, especially the older people. If we couple this with a fragmentation of the public sphere that is a result of, you know, what some would call the digital revolution, right, or the social media revolution that happened in the 2000s and 2010s, all of this has been accelerated as a result of that because it has created a two or multiple tier kind of public where some people still get their news from traditional media like newspapers and the public TV, let's say, state television station, and others are getting their information and um, their ideas shaped through um, social media platforms that are much more fast-paced and much less regulated and so on and so forth. So at the same time that we have um, a growing inequality economically between the super rich, let's say, and the, and the rest, we have a growing inequality of pace in terms of how fast um, social change is happening in the minds of different groups, different cohorts of people, both age-wise, also in terms of where they live, do they live in urban centers or rural areas, and in terms of maybe even ideological predispositions. Voters are turning back to what feels familiar and stable because they are driven by uncertainty. The second reason has to do with the fact that When you feel uncertainty because of economic dislocation and status dislocation, when you feel uncertainty because of really rapid societal changes around you, it's not uncommon for individuals to try to find solace, to try to find stability or certainty in uh, older ideas or pre-existing ideas like religion, like family like um, local community or national community, right? So I think the rise of nativist movements, the rise of conservative uh, or the strength of conservative parties to an extent, not fully, of course, because there is party strategies and uh, quality of uh, leaders and so on and so forth. To a great extent, I think, or to to an extent can be explained by this insecurity that drives people to these more stable ideas and stable identities. So what does this mean for the future of left-wing and socialist parties in the EU and beyond? We do have um, some research that can be our guide in understanding what has happened. Sherry Berman and Maria Snegovaya, they have argued that the left basically, or you know, center-left and left-wing parties in Europe in particular, made the shift in their economic policies towards the end of the 20th century. That shift was towards what we would call neoliberal economics, maybe, or what has been called the Washington Consensus. So the idea was that basically there is only one way that capitalism can function, and the rest of the differences are all in other realms of politics. And this basically, they argue, watered down the distinctive role that left-wing parties had in society, right? 
that were primarily centered around economic decisions and economic uh, policies. Also, that made it really hard for this type of center-left, left-wing politi- political parties to really uh, benefit benefit electorally, I mean, from uh, the discontent that uh, followed from the financial crisis that happened in 2008. And this lack of alternatives in the economic field, right, because of this acceptance of this consensus that had uh, emerged, led to an emphasis on cultural and social appeals rather than economical class appeals by left-wing and social democratic parties that were not successful. In fact, a lot of these cultural and social appeals are some of these appeals that I mentioned implicitly when I talked about the fast-paced societal changes that not uh, everybody is ready to follow in many societies. This inability of left-wing or center-left parties to find a new role in this stage of capitalism where a lot of people have at least decided that there's some type of consensus of how capitalism will work or should work. That consensus left them with very few alternative ways to position themselves strategically in the electoral competition. And as a result, led to an emaciated show in elections, uh, a much less strong show in elections, which, of course, At the aggregate level, they argue, undermines representative uh, democracy, right? Because we don't have um, a very clear uh, set of polls that will represent different interests, different classes, that then will somehow create some type of synthesis um, in the long term. So what we will be witnessing is many left-wing parties being in the opposition of many governments in Europe. Why is that important? There is no doubt that It is really important for the quality of any democracy that it has a really well-functioning and uh, strong government, but it's equally important to have a well-functioning and strong opposition that will play the role and serve the function of what we call accountability, both in parliament and in public discourse when it comes to media and so on and so forth. I am Evi Kiori, and this was your Active's Beyond the Byline podcast. Visit your Active to stay on top of the latest news, and if you haven't subscribed to the podcast, you can do so on your favorite podcasting app. This episode was produced by myself, and I want to thank our executive producer, Malte Gettelson. Thank you for tuning in, and until next week.